All right, so I want to welcome everyone today uh, to this Ask Me Anything, or rather we call it here, Ask Mac Anthro session, um, a chance for you to ask kind of all your burning questions about graduate studies in the Department of Anthropology at McMaster University in Hamilton. My name is Martha Cathy Newmiller. My pronouns are she, her. I am the moderator for today's session, um, so I'll be keeping an eye on that Q&A function you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, for our attendees, please feel free to make use of that, ask whatever questions you might have, and um, we will do our best to get to all of them today. I am also a sociocultural PhD student, though, in the Department of Anthropology. I conduct multisensorial ethnographic research in the urban context of the city of Hamilton, with a focus on the impact of climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies on community identity. Um, I'd now like to take a moment to turn it over to our grad studies chair, Dr. Cal Baruch, for a brief welcome message before we proceed to introductions for the panel. Okay, thanks, Martha. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, just like to welcome you to this session. We're really grateful that you're here um, and interested in learning more about our awesome department and graduate program. Um, our program offers uh, courses of study in cultural anthropology, biological anthropology, um, and archaeology at the master's and PhD level. Um, we also do have a cluster of faculty members with expertise in medical anthropology, uh, including myself, affording students the opportunity to kind of pursue um, a sort of health-focused track of study um, as well. So as Martha indicated, I'm Cal Birick, um, the graduate chair currently in the department. Um, and in the way of my interests, I'm a medical anthropologist and a cultural anthropologist. Um, my research interests kind of span critical global health studies, uh, science and technology studies, um, and queer theory. Uh, hobbies wise, I enjoy birding, pickleball, and making soap. Um, I'm a big fan of work-life balance. Um, so uh, we're all excited for um, to be here today and, uh, you know, happy to share our perspectives on the department, graduate study, or any other questions uh, you might have. So I'll throw it back over to Martha now. Thanks so much. All right. So I'll invite folks to introduce themselves. Um, we'll start with our department chair, uh, Dr. Andrew Roddick. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I am the uh, the department chair in the in the Department of Anthropology, which um, I probably should mention we're also uh, entering our 50th anniversary uh, as a Department of Anthropology. So in the coming months, you may see various things uh, coming at you about uh, about events associated with the history um, of the department. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm an archaeologist by training, so I'm part of that subdiscipline uh, in, the, in the department with uh, several other colleagues. And my work um, has focused primarily in, in the Andes of South America, working in both ancient contexts and more contemporary kinds of settings, working with uh, craft producers. Uh, I also have some projects here in, in Southern Ontario, working with Haudenosaunee um, sort of histories uh, and with Six Nations um, sort of collaborating and bridging to Indigenous studies. And perhaps we can even talk about some of those connections later in our AMA today. Um, anyways, if in general, if there's any questions about the department as a whole, I'm, I'm also happy to field any questions via email. Um, so you can find me on the website. Awesome. Thanks so much. And our grad uh, admin, John Silva. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, to this event. Uh, my name is John Silva, and my pronouns are he, him. And I've been I'm the graduate administrative assistant for the Department of Anthropology. Uh, I may be your first point of contact as you reach out uh, and email uh, our department in relation to applying to our graduate program. Um, I'm there to help you in the in ways of uh, the logistics of how to submit any technical problems that you might have or just some general questions about our program. So please feel free uh, to reach out anytime. A um, little bit about myself, although I'm not an anthropologist in training, um, I have learned quite a bit having been with the department for the past seven or eight years. Um, but I, I do have uh, a unique and rather interesting hobby in the fact that I am a certified race car driver instructor. And I do dabble in that hobby myself on the side. So uh, very different from what I do in my professional life, but I think variety is, is always a good thing. Um, I will have a small presentation for you all uh, in a little bit after the introductions, uh, just talking about the basics of how to apply and just some of the documents that uh, we require. And uh, yeah, looking forward to chatting further. Thank you. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, John. Uh, and now for our student panelists, I want to flip over to Acacia, who is a PhD uh, student in bioanthropology. Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Acacia. I'm a PhD candidate here in the department. I work with Dr. Tracy Prowl. So as Marissa said, a biological anthropologist, specifically bioarchaeology. My research focuses on medieval Croatia and looking at different ways we can take a more integrative and syndemically um, inspired approach to bioarchaeological research and whether or not that allows us to kind of glean more information. I'm also an international student. I'm assuming there might not be that many here, but if anyone has questions in that regard, I can help there as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. And now over to Amanda, who is also one of our PhD students in bioarchaeology. Uh, yeah, so my name is Amanda, and I'm a second year PhD student, uh, also bioarchaeology. Uh, I study under Dr. Megan Brickley, uh, and my doctoral research is focused on malaria in southeastern Ontario. Thank you. And now over to one of our MA students, uh, Ren who is in the bioanthropology stream and is also associated with our ancient DNA lab. Hi everyone, my name is Ren. As Martha said, I'm a master's student in biological anthropology and a member of the Mac ADNA Center supervised by Dr. Hendrik Poinar. Specifically for our lab, I work on our plague project where we utilize techniques in next generation sequencing to not only investigate the evolutionary genomics of Yersinia pestis, but also its anthropological implications. Wonderful. And last but certainly not least, Lauren, uh, who is an MA student in sociocultural anthropology. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm Lauren Charman, she, her. Um, I'm in the socio sociocultural anthropology stream. My supervisor is Dr. Yana Stanova. Um, so my research looks at violence and social marginalization within urban spaces, as well as the role of the performing arts in um, resisting oppression based on identity. So I'm particularly interested in the intersections between gender, uh, race, and sexuality. Um, and so my MA field work uh, will be a multimodal ethnography on improv comedy next summer uh, in Chicago. That sounds super exciting. All of this research is like music to my ears. Um, so I do want to invite our participants to make use of that Q&A chat function at the bottom. Um, really any questions at all, whether that's about the program, um, funding, the department, um, and then even just what it's like to live in Hamilton even. Um, but before we jump into those questions, um, John, I just want to give you an opportunity to kind of give that overview of sort of deadlines, important dates, all of that information. That's great. Thank you, Martha. Um, so I just wanted to put, put together a little presentation on just some of the basic questions that we do get um, in related uh, related to our uh, our our, um, our application process. Um, so one very important deadline uh, would be um, our official deadline, which is Monday, January fifteenth, twenty twenty four. Um, so that is uh, the expectation is that you will have your application submitted at that at that time uh, before that date. Um, now, if you do have any references, um, which you can request once you've started an application electronically, they actually can submit up until January 31st, 2024. So ideally, I mean, it's it's best not to start the application a few days before the deadline, because obviously you want to give your referees uh, as much time as possible. But uh, ultimately, we can still accept those supporting letters up until the 31st of January. Um, so uh, the expectation uh, to apply to a master's program is that you've completed a four-year honors undergraduate degree uh, that is required, and for a PhD level, a master's degree is also required. Um, there are uh, exceptional circumstances where we can consider possibly a non-honors degree or um, uh, perhaps not having a master's. It's incredibly rare. Uh, I would say that if this, if this, 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 if this um, is your situation, please reach out to me directly, and I can discuss. Um, uh, how we would proceed with something like that if, if required. Um, the other important factor I think that needs to be considered is we do encourage all applicants to reach out in advance uh, to prospective supervisors. Um, you know, you can do that by simply uh, reviewing our faculty, our, our faculty page that we have on our website. 
Um, and the goal here is that you're trying to ensure that um, there is a supervisor that can support your research that does have um, some background uh, in, in that particular subject area that you're considering. Um, also things to consider is that some faculty members may be on sabbatical uh, the particular year that you apply it may not be available to take you. Um, so it's important to find this out in advance of applying. Um, so again, a simple email, uh, maybe indicating a little bit about yourself, your educational background, um, and your pro potential proposed research interest would be a good kind of welcome um, uh, email to somebody that you, you may want to work with. So please, I do encourage you that you do that. Uh, we actually do have a section on our website um, well, after clicking on our graduate um, studies uh, section, you'll find graduate supervisors and it says find graduate supervisors in your area of interest. And we do have a list of our uh, faculty members there as well. So please um, ensure that you uh, take a look at that. Um, I also do get questions related to what does a complete application look like and what documents are required. So we do ask for a one to two page statement of interest. Uh, the topics can include uh, why you would like to pursue a graduate degree, past accomplishments, your research interest, and proposed research work, uh, just to give you some ideas. Um, we also ask for a 5 to 15 page writing sample. Uh, this is a guideline, however, um, you know, more pages are acceptable uh, if you feel necessary. Uh, this can comprise of an undergraduate or graduate paper from a court, from coursework, or perhaps a section of your MA thesis if you're applying for a PhD program. Those are all perfectly acceptable. Um, we also do require two academic reference letters. Um, Non-academic reference letters can be added as like a third reference if you feel it would be necessary, but we do uh, specifically require two academic references as part of your application. Um, we also uh, ask for a CV, uh, even a Canadian common CV is also acceptable. Um, so that would be good to include that. And we also do ask for uh, scanned copies of current transcripts. Um, this uh, you can upload yourself uh, into the portal. Um, unofficial transcripts are also uh, perfectly acceptable. However, we do prefer scanned copies of original transcripts. Uh, we do not need you to send us any official transcripts unless uh, an offer of admission is made to you. So um, yeah, unofficial uh, uh, transcripts or uh, scanned copies of official transcripts, perfectly acceptable for you to upload yourself into the application. Um, if uh, English is not your first language, uh, there are English proficiency tests that we do accept at McMaster. Uh, two of the more common ones are the IELTS and the TOEFL. Um, uh, we do have specific guidelines on our website um, and you can, I can, if you, after reaching out to me, I can send you that directly about what minimum scores are required, but there are, are also a number of exemptions that can be made based on um, where your last uh, um, educational institution was and if it was taught in, in English for a number of years. So um, again, if that uh, does uh, fall into your, uh, sorry, what I'm trying to say is that uh, if you do require an English proficiency test, please reach out directly and I can guide you on uh, what, what's required as part of the application. Um, there's only one other optional document, and we, we call that the extenuating circumstances statement, uh, only if applicable. And this would be um, a situation perhaps where, um, you know, you're, during your academic career, it, it was interrupted by an unexpected life event that interfered with your ability to perform at your academic best, and you would like uh, to make us aware of that. Um, again, we do not require anything personal or confidential but rather a statement just outlining that for a period of time you were met with some unexpected challenges that prevented you from attaining the results that you had expected. Um, sometimes, you know, life happens and we understand that, um, especially considering the last two or three years were, were rather challenging, I think, for all of us. And I'm sure uh, it may have had an impact on your ability to perform at your absolute best. So, you know, making us aware of that, um, it's completely uh, acceptable. Okay. I hope that you found this information useful and I welcome every opportunity to chat with you either by email or phone. Um, you can reach me. Uh, and again, this information is all available on our website, but you can reach me at gradmin, so G-R-A-D-M-I-N at mcmaster.ca. Or you can also call me at 905-525-9140. And our direct extension is 24424. And as I said, this information is readily available on our website as well. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Wonderful. Thanks so much, John. Um, and that information, as John said, available in lots of places, um, but definitely reach out if you have questions. Um, that's what John is there for. Um, he's been a great resource, I know, to all of us students um, who are currently in program. We do have a, a question here that I think is a great one. Um, so I have graduated with, with an anthropology major from a Bangladeshi university and have been working for the refugee response related to health. Um, my question is, is there an age limit? Uh, what funding opportunities are available for grad students and what research opportunities currently exist in the department? So um, maybe the first two, John, if you don't mind fielding those ones, um, and then the research opportunities, perhaps um, Andy and Cal can chime in about kind of what's happening faculty level wise. Okay, so um, the um, there is no particular age limit to apply to our program, obviously, right? It's not even a question that's asked in our application. So um, yeah, there's nothing there to be concerned about. Um, uh, funding opportunities. Uh, so uh, there is a minimum uh, requirement for funding for doctoral students. And it works out to be about $17,500 Canadian plus the cost of tuition. That works out to just about a hair under uh, $24,000 total. Um, there is no minimum for the master's level. However, uh, historically, we've been rather competitive with um, our competing institutions across Ontario, and it's our way of kind of validating that, at least on the financial um, side, web, that, we, that we are competitive. Um, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, funding international students can be somewhat of a challenge, um, uh, although things are changing and there are some new um, initiatives being brought about by both the university and our faculty to address that. Um, internally, uh, we do have a very prestigious award that was uh, given to us by um, a donor, uh, supports mainly students who study in the biological side of anthropology, but it's one way that we can actually support international students. Um, and there are many uh, other uh, awards offered by the Canadian government that I can certainly, um, if you reach out to me directly, link you up to that you can apply directly, and that can help support some research uh, um, that, you know, here in, in Canada. Um, but uh, generally speaking, I mean, if you are an international student and you're unable to attain some of those that I've suggested, um, we can, if you do come self-funded, and by self-funded, I mean that you can provide proof of uh, a scholarship that had been earned from your home country, uh, that's something we can entertain. Um, we would just need proof that, you know, the, the funds would be coming your way once you arrive um, to Canada and so forth. But uh, that's that's another option. We've had a couple students uh, more recently, I think, from the U.S. who uh, earned a Fulbright scholarship from the United States, and that supported her her funding as an international student here in our department to do her one year masters. So that's another example of that. And we even have I was going to I just thought about this, but there's a very prestigious award uh, within Canada called the Vanier uh, Scholarship, and that is actually open to um, international students as well. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, <laughs> award to earn, but it doesn't mean that it's not possible and it's something that you could put on your radar. Again, I can elaborate on that further if you'd like to uh, email me directly about that. I think, did I, am I missing a question there? Can't recall uh, if there was just there. around age limit, um, which as far as my experience is being slightly more mature, I was not a direct entry kind of straight through high school and then undergrad and then master's into the PhD program. Um, but I, if you want to address that as well, and then I actually, before we go to, to Cal and Andy afterwards, I want to give Acacia a chance to, to respond as well, because you mentioned your international student experience. Absolutely. Yeah. So as I said, I mean, I, I, I don't, there is no particular age limit when it comes to applying to our graduate program. We actually have a lot of um, students that have been working, you know, in, in, in the field or in, you know, and they've decided they want to come back and do their master's degree, or perhaps they completed their master's, um, you know, five, six years ago and have decided, you know what, I'd like to pursue a doctoral. So, uh, yeah, that's something that we're very open to as well. Wonderful. Thanks, John. Acacia, do you want to maybe chime in about your experience on that front? Yeah, so for international students, John covered funding and stuff. Another thing to say that as a student permit, you can work in Canada. There's generally an hour limit to how much a week you can work under your student permit. 
that's kind of been, I think lately they've made some exceptions because of COVID and other various things that have been going on. So I'm not quite sure what the current status is or if that applies to all new applicants or just a specific pool of applicants, because sometimes they'll make these exceptions where people who got their student permit for these years can get an exception to some of those regulations. But yeah, so I think that's all I had to add. No, that's great. That's, I think, definitely a helpful thing to point out that there is the ability to actually earn an income uh, while also being part of the student experience that often takes form of a research assistant or teaching assistant type of position. Um, so that's a, a great point to address. Um, Cal or Andy, if you want to jump in about kind of what sort of research is going on in the department, um, and so what opportunities might be available for someone wanting to to come in and do their grad studies here. Well, maybe maybe I'll start, Cal, and then you can you can add on. Um, so, I mean, I think the I mean the website, even though our website I should mention is sort of undergoing uh, some changes from the the larger university. That's always a good place to start. You get a sense of what kind of research is happening in the department, both by faculty members and uh, and graduate students. Um, now, in terms of you know entering in with with the kind of research questions that interest you, um, there's there's no you know there's no rule or regulation that your your work has to be exactly what uh, what faculty members are doing. Um, but the certainly the 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 website gives you a sense of some of the research trajectories. We have actually some research clusters that define some of the kinds of research that, that drives our interests. Um, so th that would really be my, my first step is to make sure that when you look at that website and, you know, given your own background in, in anthropology, that this resonates in one way or another. Um, in some ways, the worst thing you can do is go to a department that, that doesn't resonate, right? There should be something that excites you, whether that's uh, particular faculty members or particular clusters of research happening in laboratories. Um, so it, it is, it is in some senses, a two-way street. You want to find a place that, that, that it's excited by you and that you're excited by, um, successes in grad school really are defined by that. If you end up in a place that, you know, you're doing research that doesn't align with, with your interests, you're probably not going to finish your degree. Um, so in terms of that, I mean, this really does go back to the point that was made earlier about how important it is. Uh, I see Patrick's question in the, in the chat as well, and it relates to this. I mean, I think. This is really where having conversations with potential um, advisors is really important um, because this is really the opportunity for you to start a conversation about, you know, what corners of the discipline um, are of interest to you. Um, you can expect perhaps, you know, response, at least one that I tend to give to potential students is, is a pretty, uh, a pretty obvious one, which is, you know, what kind of anthropological questions drive your, your research interests, right? So, if you're working in a very different context than I do, so you don't work in the South American context or in, in, in and around the Great Lakes, that's totally fine as long as it's something that aligns with, you know, stuff that I'm interested in or methodologies that I can help with. Um, it, the tr trouble in these application processes is often where it's completely out of left field and there's not a lot of, uh, a lot of alignments um, because just like it's a lot of work for students coming into a grad program, um, it can also be a lot of work for potential advisees if it's, you know, well outside of their, their area. Um, so that's the importance of that, that communication, that, that give and take. Um, uh, and so I guess the second part of this question, and again, maybe Cal can speak to the more specifics of, uh, of, of some of this for the cultural side, but, um, you know, the second part of this is once you, you are in, I should stress that, that one of the things that, that we require in our program is for you to apply to, to funding, um, so all the graduate students in this in a Zoom chat have um, either one or in the process of applying to um, to SHRC, which is the Canadian one of the major federal Canadian social sciences funding bodies. Um, not everybody gets it, um, but it is it is an important step for a variety of reasons, both practically in terms of your finances, but also in terms of training as an academic, knowing how to develop these kinds of grant proposals, and so. The research opportunities are wedded to that. There is a sense that you are going to engage with that with that process, um, and there is also um, um, research opportunities in terms of some research funding for uh, lab and field work. Now, again, it's competitive. We have to we have to apply for it every year, but the hope is that um, uh, students apply to larger pools uh, at both the university level as well as the government level um, to find that support. Uh, because the reality as an academic is this is what we do, right? We 
we apply to find the the, the resources for this work. Um, Pal, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I think you covered it pretty well. Um, I, I think that um, the question of research opportunities also sort of depends on your eventual supervisor in, in some sense. So there are, of course, you know, opportunities uh, for faculty members in the department who might have um, a grant, for instance, and uh, can can take up students as research assistants on that project, um, which could, of course, also potentially, you know, result in things like co-authored publications and things like that. Um, I think, yeah, from the cultural anthropology side, I guess to emphasize what Andy was saying, um, you know, I, I don't think your your research questions or you know topic need to perfectly um, align with like exactly what. Um, this is definitely from the cultural perspective, um, you know, what your potential supervisor is is doing. Um, but, you know, for instance, um, I'm supervising around committees for a lot of projects that um, at face value might not, you know, have that much to do with my actual research. Um, but, you know, where I can bring in expertise as a medical anthropologist, for instance, and even my, my doctoral students myself, right, um, their projects, I, I work on global health projects in Malawi primarily um, in questions of data and the politics of data. Um, but two of the projects I'm advising are um, on midwifery and queer families in Canada, right? Which um, align with my expertise and theoretical interests, but you know, aren't necessarily aligned with what exactly I'm, I'm doing at this moment in terms of my own projects. Um, and yeah, I don't know if this will come up later, but in terms of sort of individual research on the part of grad students. Um, we do have uh, two competitions per year within the department where you can um, sort of, you know, maybe earn some internal funding, whether to present work at conferences or um, also to, to carry out uh, research related to your project in the case of doctoral students. So, um, and, and there are also, of course, aside from the grants that Andy mentioned, right, um, there are a few resources across campus, depending on your interests and things like that for um, also winning uh, research money and awards, so. Thank you, that was um, a wonderful response. I think we covered a lot of bases. Um, we do have a couple of more questions uh, coming in, but I also wanted to give an opportunity um, to hear from our student panelists as well about kind of the type of research they're doing. We kind of got a little brief uh, insight with that intro and, and all of that, but maybe if you're doing lab work or um, you're traveling to do your work, I think kind of giving some perspective on the ways and places that our students are doing that work would be lovely. So um, I might call on some folks if you're okay with that. Um, so we'll kick it off with Amanda, if you don't mind. Hi, sure. Um, okay, so earlier I mentioned that I'm studying malaria in Southeast Ontario, so it is historic malaria, um, thus the bioarchaeological component, um, and uh, this research has, it's, I, I think of it kind of in an interdisciplinary type lens, because a significant part of the research is archival, um, as well as um, hoping to work with uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit for their sort of impact and experience of the disease. And um, a cornerstone of the research that I'm doing is on anthropogenic modification of the landscape. So in what ways did we modify the landscape, building dams, um, transitioning to agriculture, things like this, which might have caused malaria transmission to increase or ultimately to be eliminated as well. Um, so as you can imagine, that involves significant um, geography, geology, uh, so various disciplines, things like that. And then um, I also do a lot of work in the department for um, RA, like a research assistantship. And a lot of that work has focused on um, looking at uh, teeth from uh, children from uh, the 18th and 19th century Montreal two sites and three sites from 17th to 19th century in the Netherlands. Um, so looking to see if we can uh, locate vitamin D deficiency in the teeth. So in that capacity, I have done uh, quite a bit of lab work um, with micro CT uh, reconstructions of the teeth using dragonfly software um, to sort of slide through the slices of the teeth to identify systemic issues and things like that. So um, 
And I've had the opportunity to present at a numerous conferences now, um, some for that RA work. And I was also uh, an invited speaker in June to Leiden to talk about uh, my preliminary malaria research, which was really cool. That's fantastic. That sounds really, really exciting. <laughs> and so, so often when you get to be an invited speaker somewhere, um, I had the joy of being an invited session at uh, AAA in Casca the, a couple of weeks ago. So that was really cool getting to talk about multisensorial uh, ethnography. Um, want to pop over to one of our MA students. And Lauren, do you want to share a little bit more about your plans? I, you mentioned improv in Chicago. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Martha. Um, so as I said, I'll be doing my field work next year in Chicago. And I think one of the things to know about like the grad program here at McMaster and sort of the deciding factor for me in terms of coming here, I did my under undergraduate degree here. Um, I really enjoyed the department. Um, faculty, the grad students that I knew when I was an undergrad were really wonderful. Um, so that was one deciding factor. But another one was that at the master's level, um, it's unique in that it's a two year program. A lot of the programs I was looking at were only one year and field work was either very rare or an impossibility. Um, but it's really nice. I thought it was really nice that McMaster offered, um, like MacAnthro offered uh, a two year thesis base. So I actually could get that experience with field work before I continued on to my PhD. Um, so I'll be doing that field work uh, next year. Awesome. Thank you. Ren, do you want to share a little bit about your research and kind of what you've been getting up to? Sure. So as mentioned before, I am part of the Ancient DNA Center where I study plague or specifically the bacterium Yersinia pestis. Um, the Ancient DNA Center is based in the Department of Anthropology, but we have many students who come from biology and biochemistry. So we have that interdisciplinarity working um, in our favor. Uh, we have a lot of global collaborators who send us samples for us to test for ancient pathogens. So specifically, I'm working with uh, human teeth from the first plague pandemic, Turkey. Um, and I've just recently received sequencing data for that. So I'm working to analyze um, and fingers crossed we find something, but uh, it just goes to show how interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary this uh, department can be. That's wonderful, thank you. Acacia, do you want to share a little bit more about the work you've been doing? Yeah, so like I said before, my the context of my research is in medieval Croatia. So I did do field work a couple of years ago. So part of that cobbled together funding from the department, the university, and some other places to go do field work in Zagreb for a couple of months to get my data. And I look, my research looks you know, it's focused towards how can we take this more integrative approach and I'm looking at diet, disease and mortality risk. So for my research, that means I do stable isotope analysis. So there was a very heavy, very long <laughs> lab component there. Um, in addition to that, I've also had the opportunity to do some fun lab work for coursework during my time here. So I also got to do some work on teeth with my previous advisor for my master's here at McMaster looking at vitamin D deficiency, like Amanda was talking about. And um, yeah, and I get to collaborate. So it's an international project. So for my research, I collaborate with colleagues in Croatia. I collaborate with the director of the project that I work on. He's an archaeologist based out of France. So have gotten to make some really great connections there. And also to build off what Amanda said in terms of RA ships, um, I think it's fun RA ships kind of give you an opportunity to work on projects that are different from your own while you're doing your PhD. So for myself, I have an RA ship that's actually outside of the department with the philosophy department and work on a project that centers around social innovation, knowledge mobilization and skills development. And so uh, these are things that, you know, really important for grad school, but obviously very different from looking at skeletons in my little hidey, hidey hole basement lab. Um, so yeah, I've gotten an opportunity to do a lot of different things and meet a lot of different people here, which is awesome. I think you hit on a really great point that there are opportunities 
certainly within the department, but outside of it as well. Um, I've had some of those too. I was an educational development fellow for a year with the McPherson Institute. Um, so that was a focus on uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning in higher education. Um, got to do like course refinements, work with professors from like engineering and science. And so kind of all over the place, which was a really great uh, opportunity and chance for exposure to other parts of the university. Um, and I've also done RA ships with um, the Department of Political Science and Anesthesiology. Um, so again, sounds super unrelated to anthropology, but helped me um, not only use the skills that I was developing in-house, but learn some new ones that I could bring back into my own work. Um, I wanna get to some of the next questions though. Um, so Patrick, I think we touched on yours a little bit, but I do wanna just draw it forward here in case there's any other comments. Um, so Patrick's question is, in a case where you contact a potential research supervisor and you don't get any responses, um, would you advise someone to continue their application and is there still a possibility of gaining admission? Um, so I had the experience of um, having someone who was interested in my work. Um, but I don't think that's always been the case, but perhaps I'll open that up to um, Cal and Andy, if you want to jump in and maybe possibly address that. And John, I'm sure you might have something to say there as well. I guess, I mean, I guess I would, what I would suggest in this kind of scenario, I mean, the first, the first thing is it, you know, uh, this time of year is very busy. And so it is always possible that, um, that your, you know, your contact to that individual came in, in through a barrage of, of emails and, and got buried. And I, I say that knowing that I have a couple of such emails to respond to this week. So if, uh, I don't think Patrick, you were one of the students that got buried, but it does happen and you should feel free to follow up. Um, if you do follow up, what I would say is perhaps take some of the suggestions that have come up here today on board. So perhaps giving um, giving your potential supervisor a sense of why you think they're they're a good match. Um, you know there there are cases sometimes where we receive emails that are very um, that are very vague. Um, so they might include the necessary question, which is, are you taking students uh, in the coming year? That's a good a good question to add. Um, but I would I would really sort of suggest as much as possible giving a bit of background in that email as to who you are and why you think. Um, that this particular department might be a nice fit for you. Um, and also providing, you know, enough of that information that, that can initiate that kind of conversation. The other sort of thing I would also highlight, and I, I think it was mentioned by John earlier, is, um, you know, we do have faculty that are either on leave currently, uh, and some of those faculty um, perhaps aren't as responsive to email um, as they're, they're conducting research. Some folks are, you know, sporadic in their, in their email uh, contact, but, Sometimes these things do get buried, or or they they um, they've neglected to respond simply because they are not taking students. But I would um, I would encourage a follow up email if you haven't done so already. Um, the second part of that question is whether you know whether there's a high possibility of gaining admission. I mean, I know you know the fact of the matter is it it costs money uh, to to apply to these programs, um, and you know I know folks have different financial uh, capabilities, and so um, you know if if you haven't received a response. Um, you know, I think for most of my colleagues, uh, and again, Cal, Cal perhaps can can throw can throw uh, another perspective into the mix. But I, I do think that you should expect some feedback um, when we when we look at applications um, to give you a sense of what happens behind the scenes. Right, w one of the things that happens is is um, there is sort of limitations when we accept students into the program. I don't think this has come up yet. Um, we're a medium-sized department that really um, is structured, I mean, I think it's to say across all the sub-disciplines, really around an apprenticeship model, which means that unlike some larger programs that might take, um, you know, many, many students, we, we don't tend to do that. We have a smaller, uh, smaller number of students that we admit. And within that process, um, you know, it varies from year to year, but because we are a sub-disciplinary program, it means there's always a bit of a negotiation in terms of uh, how many students that we accept into a given um, program. And so um, just to give you a sense, you know, it's it's very unlikely, for instance, that in a given year we would accept, you know, six or seven or eight bioarchaeologists. That is mainly just because we have to balance our faculty uh, capabilities with um, 
uh, you know, with that kind of model, right? Um, I'll also say that there are limitations um, from the province of Ontario. So some of you may be applying to other Ontario universities, and there's a uh, there's regulations in terms of how much departments can contract and, and expand in a given year. So um, that's a very long-winded way of saying that a follow up again. Um, but if you don't hear responses, um, uh, I would say that you'd want to hear a response. Uh, to be to be honest. Uh, Cal, do you want to add? Did I sort of hit on, on that one? Yeah, I think you covered it. I mean, I think, yeah, just to echo, I think that, you know, um, yeah, like Andy, I think I have some of these in my inbox as well. And, and just I receive like a massive volume of these kind of outreach requests. So I would say the the best way to approach it, um, some of the ones I receive that I'm most likely to respond to are where people attach like a research proposal or, you know, um, are able to really convincingly sort of say you know why their work relates to mine i will say i have received some that i i don't respond to well deliberately because they're from archaeologists or biological anthropologists and just i don't see any fit and so in those cases where i don't respond it's it's just sort of um it's clear and it should be clear to the person as well um you know i think uh yeah better than sort of just a brief uh sentence would be you know, I've attached um, some of the, you know, a rough sort of uh, write up of, of the kind of questions I would like to ask in the program. And, um, you know, that kind of thing, I, I think, is um, is the best thing you can do. But, you know, also people are people and some people um, aren't good at responding to emails and some are. And, um, you know, I, I think I would echo Andy. Um, you know, that said, I, I think there have been um, there's also something to say for uh, you know, students uh, who haven't been as aware that they should be reaching out before they apply. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think it's impossible that, um, or that that person would be completely disadvantaged if they hadn't reached out because there is a process that we do for admissions where, you know, we do take a look at all the applications. So, um, you know, I know these can also be cultural differences. I, I did my graduate school experience in the U.S. and um, it's much less common there to reach out to faculty members before you apply. So, um, it, you know, I would say that it's not impossible that someone would be admitted so long as in the materials it's clear um, that they have a well-prepared research proposal, good writing sample, and, um, it, you know, good references and make a clear case as to why they'd like to work with um, a specific supervisor. So, um, but yeah, I think in these cases, it's just, um, we do receive a massive volume of email. So uh, yeah, I think, you know, following up and or just making sure you're clear in um, in the ask and, and the reaching out, right? Um, I also, myself, I don't have um, always, uh, especially I think if you reach out earlier in the, the admission cycle, it can be better. Um, like I don't, I don't have the capacity to meet with every student who's interested in working with me, which is why it's good to send the proposal um, because it gives me a, a better sense. Um, but I think the earlier you can reach out in the admission cycle, the better because um, it's just a very, very busy time uh, in, in December, no, November and December, I would say. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to just give an opportunity if any of the students um, on our panel have um, or are participating in more of a kind of an apprenticeship model with their work um, to give you an opportunity to speak to that. I know, Andy, you flagged that as um, something that might be of interest to folks. So if, if none of the students want to talk, maybe Andy, you could briefly address that. Based on the crickets, I think it's up to you, Andy. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess the reason I was bringing that up because I know that, you know, as, as potential students are looking at programs, one of the things perhaps that they don't ask is what, you know, what a day-to-day -day looks like, right? And so in some programs, I know, for instance, in the UK, uh, in my sort of area of, of research, there's also often kind of a, you know, big classes, um, you know, maybe not as much contact with, with your advisor, um, and perhaps a lot more classwork, right? Um, and I think it's probably important to sort of point out that um, and we have different models, and uh, those are laid out on the website in terms of the major research paper versus the thesis approach. But um, but a lot of our, you know, we don't have the heavy course load that some programs might have. Um, and the expectation is there's a lot more perhaps directed reading courses with your advisor. 
Um, and depending again on what area of, of anthropology you lie on, it might mean you know more interaction in lab settings or field settings. Um, and certainly kind of um, you know encouraging much more scaffolding around around methodology, for instance, uh, with with that advisor. Um, so yeah, I just I just wonder because because and you know maybe I'll also suggest for those listening that we'd encourage you to reach out to potential faculty members. Um, the other thing I often tend to, to suggest that potential students do is reach out to graduate students. So if you are applying, for instance, to the you know cultural side, um, in addition to reaching out to you know potential faculty members, um, I think it's actually good to follow up with grad students and say you know what 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 do you like about this program? I mean I, we're getting some of that. I'm sure we'll get some of that in the session today, but you can be very proactive in terms of of, of doing that. Um, and just as a random aside, I mean, I can say that when I applied to PhD programs, I did that and I pulled my application from one institution after having that back and forth, because it became very clear to me that that was not really the model that, you know, it was a very prestigious place, but I just didn't really see myself enjoying my, my career in that kind of setting. Um, so being proactive about that and getting a sense of what learning looks like and what the day-to-day -day looks like, um, because, Grad school, as again, all the grad students in this room will tell you, it, you know, it can be very stressful and it can be anxiety provoking. And you want to know what, you know, what it means to be in a cohort of other graduate students and what it means to have a certain kind of relationship with a uh, an advisor. Um, Lauren, are you gonna are you gonna help me out here? Yeah, absolutely. I think like that question of um, the cult the the culture fit was was really important when I was looking. Um, and one of the things I would say about the department is. Um, speaking to the subdisciplines is the ability to communicate across subdisciplines, um, across like the fields. So not only with like fellow grad students, but also um, with professors. I've had the opportunity, like even in my undergrad, to work within archaeology, bridging cultural anthropology um, on a project with Dr. Roddick. Um, so there is that opportunity to just like also just to pop your head in someone's office and have a chat even if it's about you know um questions about grad school um so I, I, I guess just to say that culture is important and oftentimes like Andy's saying like reaching out to a, a grad student you might get a better picture of what what the culture looks like is it is it welcoming um does it are the sub disciplines really siloed and you can't have conversations across them. Um, those are kind of important deciding factors, especially if you're going to spend, you know, years of your life somewhere. That's a great, great point. Um, I mean, I, I'll speak for myself and not all the panelists here, but I know I'm happy to, to answer questions when it comes to the sociocultural side of things. Um, and we do have, um, unfortunately, it's only PhD students at this point on the website, but you can actually find um, PhD students who are currently studying in the department on our, our department website. So that's a great way to also see kind of what people are working on and, and maybe who to reach out to to ask some of those questions. Um, I do see we have some more questions in the Q&A uh, channel, but I also wanted, I think this might be a good opportunity. Um, maybe Cal, if you wanna speak and Andy, you you taught it at my year, um, but the grad workshop, which is one of those kind of like standard unifying courses that brings a whole cohort together. If you can maybe give a little insight to what the, the grad workshop is like. Sure, yeah, um, as a grad chair, I'm currently uh, like heading up the um, professionalization workshop, as we call it. So um, the workshop is kind of, I would describe it as not like a formal class, but more an informal space where I guess it serves a number of purposes. Uh, one of them is um, you're kind of in it with uh, all of the other members of your cohort, all the other students admitted in that particular year, including MAs and PhDs. Um, and it kind of varies depending on who's leading it and often depending on the composition of the cohort. Um, uh, and so um, in the workshop, we usually meet uh, about every other week or so. Um, and uh, some of the topics we've looked at most recently are sort of, um, you know, how you go about writing uh, in grad school and for grad school. Um, we've uh, talked, we've had visits from more senior students in the department where we did sort of something like this, like a, a kind of like ask me anything um, where you can get 
you know, uh, student perspectives on uh, questions that as a new grad student, you might be anxious about. Um, we talked most recently this week, we had a little session on um, conferencing and conferences and how to go about networking and how to go about, you know, presenting at maybe your, your first conference and things like that. Um, we talk about re grant writing and research proposals, uh, how to go about writing an effective uh, grant, for instance, or, or research proposal. Um, and the workshop, I should say, is kind of <laughs> blended with um, sort of every other week we have a meeting of the workshop and then every other week um, we sort of uh, attend uh, the department's speaker series. Uh, so uh, the speaker series features, um, you know, scholars uh, that come in and um, give a talk on their current research, whether from sociocultural, biological, or archaeological perspectives. Um, and so the students in the workshop are expected uh, in the first year and, and also beyond that to sort of attend those, um, those seminar sessions. And um, it's a good opportunity as well to sort of practice and get comfortable with um, responding to academic work or, you know, asking questions of uh, leading scholars in, in the field. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say is um, one other aspect of the workshop uh, is that um, we do invite the PhD students who finish crafting their, their doctoral proposals to sort of give a kind of a brief um, 15, 20 minute sort of presentation to the other students to, again, sort of um, create a, a, a sort of a sense of, of community, but also a model where, you know, if you're a new grad student, you get a sense of, okay, this is um, a more senior grad student presenting their work. What is a proposal? Um, what, you know, what does a uh, dissertation project look like? Uh, things like that. So um, yeah, hopefully that was helpful. No, it was great. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of questions here that are maybe a little more administrative um, that, John, if you don't may mind chiming in. So we have Stephanie asking, is internal funding impacted if a student is awarded Tri-Council funding or a Vanier Award? Um, and then Patrick also wondering what the acceptance rate is for the department. Thanks, Martha. Um, yeah, so it is common practice to have, I guess we would call it something like a clawback policy should a prestigious award be earned. Um, uh, it is common practice among Ontario institutions as well as across Canada. Now, uh, the, the, the amount or the, the decision to claw back is ultimately a departmental and in some cases faculty decision, and it may vary among institutions. What I would say is that um, if you are in a position where you are made an offer of admission, and in order to make that decision, it would be important, obviously, to know what, what the department's clawback policy would be. I would say at that point, it would be a good time to reach out so that you can um, make your decision based on that. Um, so um, I do know that our faculty is currently in the process of, of um, uh, I guess, um, updating our, 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 our policies when it comes to that. And so I would suspect that by the time we're getting offers out, uh, perhaps in February uh, to late February, that um, I should have that decision uh, information available. And obviously I can uh, pass that on to uh, students that um, have, have had offers made and would like to know that in advance of making a decision. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything, maybe Andy wanted to shed some light on that as well, but if, if you think that's uh, um, basically what, what happens, so yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's right, John. I mean, I think uh, there is a slight shift happening right now, which is uh, historically it's been at the department level and um, that is being shifted to the, the faculty level. And so I expect in the next, I, I, know, I, I can't guarantee, but next few weeks we're gonna have much more clarity in terms of what that's gonna look like. Um, just to add to John, though, the other thing I would suggest for those of you who are applying to several different spaces in, in the province, um, you know, if you if you get an offer from um, from from McMaster, as well as another institution, um, you know, come back and let us know what that what that offer looks like. And, um, you know, there's there, there's not a lot, a, a lot we can sort of renegotiate, but um, but it is good to keep John in the loop uh, as to those kinds of conversations going forward and and um and then we can kind of you know chat through what it looks like um and maybe another sort of an important part to, to add to this is um when you are applying and should you receive an offer uh and again maybe some of the grad students can speak to this in the room as well um I do think it's important to kind of um you know broaden the perspective in terms of what these offers entail in different in the different places so that 
um, you know, getting a sense of what, you know, what rental looks like in Hamilton and what, um, you know, cost of living. And um, so again, getting, I mean, earlier we were talking about the culture of the department, you know, getting a sense of what Hamilton looks like too, right? I think that, um, uh, I mean, I think it's safe to say that some students come to Hamilton are actually pleasantly surprised by what, you know, what this city has to offer. And so, um, you know, again, that goes back to, to, to reaching out to graduate students and getting a sense. Um, Amanda. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, from personal experience uh, that um, pay attention to the fine print on your offers. Um, I know elsewhere where I was offered, it was at first glance, more money, um, but then they don't have guaranteed TA ships. Um, so if that's something, if you don't get a TA ship, then you actually might have less coming in than you anticipated. So just make sure that you understand how all of those nuances actually pan out before making your decision. It's not just the baseline number. That's a great, great point. John, you wanna chime in again? <laughs> Yeah, I just thought I'd add as we talk about the culture of the university and like, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you may be spending a year to two to four or more years of your life, um, you know, at this institution in the city. And so it's important, I think, if, if you haven't visited um, Hamilton, um, I just want to give you a quick idea that, you know, we are geographically, I think, located in a very unique area in the sense that 10 minutes in one direction, you're in one of, one of the largest city centers in Canada that has all of the amenities that you would expect from a city, whether it be culinary or art, or, um, you know, it's, it's you get the big city vibe. But then if you head over 10 minutes in the other direction, we actually have waterfalls nearby and an escarpment and hiking trails. And, you know, it's again, it, it appeases, I think, a wide variety of, of interests, and it's rather unique. Um, the, the campus itself is located in a very affluent area of, of Hamilton called Westdale. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's just, again, it's, if you're going to spend uh, many years of your life, sometimes that's an important consideration. I just thought I'd add that as we were talking about culture and so forth. So thank you. <laughs> no, that's great. I think it's, it's really important to get that perspective. And if you're able to visit, that's great. But I know for lots of folks, that's not, um, necessarily an option because whether that's flights or time or whatever, um, it, it can be challenging to make that, that trip to do a visit, um, but I think there's, you know, as John said, a, a wonderful blend in Hamilton of kind of getting that big city vibe. We've got lovely restaurants downtown and in other areas of the, the city. We do have great hiking trails. There's the waterfront right on Lake Ontario. Um, there's, you know, so much to that. And then you're also, um, you know, roughly an hour from the border with the U.S. and going into Buffalo and you've got Niagara Falls there and sort of wine country and then in the other direction you're heading into Toronto, um, you know, one of the, the biggest cities in North America and certainly the largest in Canada. And so you've got all of that sort of right at your fingertips as well and, and the public transit um, that's available kind of does a pretty decent job of getting you around town. Um, so those are great considerations. Um, I want to jump quickly uh, to that question of acceptance rate, um, if we could, and then maybe tie into that um, Patrick's follow-up around um, full funding to international students. I think we've addressed that a little bit, but maybe you can clarify for us, John. Yeah, so, I mean, the acceptance rate, I would say, um, you know, as I said, we are a smaller department and therefore our intake is on, on the smaller side. Um, you know, uh, the amount of offers we send out um, at each cycle can vary, uh, obviously, depending on, you know, the amount of financial support we can provide to students in addition to various policies that um, are often dictated by our, obviously our government and so forth and within the university. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, we can see anywhere from about 40 to 70 applications to our department um, every year. That's that's combined between MA and PhD. And those numbers fluctuate. You know, some years are heavier PhD versus MA and so forth. Depends, right? And especially within the subdisciplines, right? It, you never know from year one year to the next where the demand is coming from. Um, again, we typically, out of that amount, can accept anywhere from eight to 14 graduate students. Again, it varies from year to year for a number of reasons, for you know, a variety of reasons that I've mentioned, but um, that's that's kind of you know what you're looking at, at least from this department's perspective, right? I hope that somewhat answers the question. And yeah, just to uh, elaborate again on the funding aspect, yes, it is very challenging to, to 
fun international uh, graduate students, especially at the MA level. As I said, um, we did have an MA student uh, earn a Fulbright from the US recently that did come in with the scholarship. Uh, we've had uh, in the past, a few of our doctoral students come in with scholarships from their home countries. Uh, they were able to verify that uh, via letters and so forth. Um, but again, an international student is eligible for the Vanier, prestigious Vanier scholarship. Um, and they're also, um, if you're a bio arc student, uh, sorry, a bio, a bio ant student, um, we do have an internal award that's also available. So uh, for that particular one, as long as you apply to our program and there is interest um, from a potential faculty member, you'll be automatically considered um, for the um, internal um, bioanthropology. Uh, scholarship that we have for international students. So that's not something that you have to necessarily apply separately for or indicate on your application. Uh, we, we will often see what we can do for those types of students um, uh, once we see the applications come in. I think that answers the question, hopefully. So. Oh, that's great. Thanks, John. Um, there's a question here from Asia wondering about kind of examples of proposals. Um, I know that that can vary. Uh, dramatically between even subdisciplines, um, but if there's something um, you might be able to speak to in terms of if we have any resources available. I know when I wrote mine, I googled examples <laughs> um, and read through a variety of different templates and kind of talked with some friends who had already um, gained admission to the program um, and so was able to get some insight that way into kind of how they crafted their letters. Um, so maybe that's an opportunity where you say if you're going to reach out to it, you know, current grad students, you could always maybe probe them a little bit about what did you include in your your proposal. But um, John, I don't know if you want to suggest any resources. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure that I have necessarily in uh, in my possession right now a resource that I can send out and say, here, this is how you should write, you know, a grad application proposal. Um, and I, you know, I, I would obviously hesitate to send out any samples from past proposals for obvious reasons, but, um, yeah, I mean, I'd say, I'd say, you know, I mean, if you are at, at a current institution that, you know, that perhaps you could go to their department grad program and see if maybe there's someone there that can give you some advice, perhaps, um, you know, a, a faculty member that's currently in your undergraduate course, or that's been running a, a, a master's course, that you could ask about, or perhaps a grad chair um, within your own institution. Um, and uh, I mean, I hate to say it, but I mean, maybe Googling something like this might not be a bad idea either, just to, I'm sure they're floating around somewhere that, you know, will hit some forums or questions that have been asked in the past about writing uh, proposals. But I mean, obviously your best source, I think if you are currently at, a, at an academic institution is look within that department and see if someone can give you some guidance on that, so. I, yeah, I mean, I. I can add a couple of things. I mean, I think I think that, you know, there's a couple broad stro stroke things we can do. I mean, we're not gonna, we, we, we can't give you samples as John said, um, and we can't really give you a template because really the point of this is to to show kind of where, you know, how, where you've come from and where you'd like to go. But just like the, the conversation with potential supervisors, there's a couple of things you need, you need to have in there, right? Which um, essentially is an introduction to who you are you know, what your background in anthropology is, like where, how you've, you know, how, how you've developed a certain set of skills or, or interests. Um, so a little bit of that kind of broader context. Um, and then as much as you can, right? And these things can change. So it's not like you're painting yourself into a corner here, but as much as you can, what what you envision doing in, in grad school, like what do you want to to do, right? And, and what kinds of questions and problems do you want to grapple with? What what drives you? So if you are, you know, going from an undergraduate background in anthropology and you want to go to grad school, I would really encourage you to have more than just a vague sense of like, I don't want to go get a job or whatever, right? Like you really, if, if that's sort of the where you're at, you know, maybe taking a year um, or two and, you know, getting getting some sort of job experience and, and thinking a, a bit more what those questions are, that might be the right the right stage. So, um, you know, the, the reason I keep thinking about the apprenticeship model is that we can only apprentice students who have interests that we can kind of work with and cater to. Um, I wouldn't say we're a department that kind of has things we just slot you into, right? Like there's not a, a conveyor belt of, of anthropology graduate work to, to put you into. And so if you're not sure what those those driving questions are, you know, it may well be it's worth giving 
giving yourself a little bit of time to to reflect and, and work that through. Uh, but if you do have those questions, that's a great time to to lay them out, right? Like, why do you have those questions? Why, where do those interests come from? Um, are there particular skill sets, you know, whether it's field work or laboratory work or, you know, ethnographic engagement that you really are excited about, you know, working with? And then, so that's, you know, I've got one section on introducing yourself, another on the kinds of specifics of your, your anthropological interests. And then the third is really why us, right? So, I mean, if you've introduced it all like that, and so, I mean, I can use Amanda as an example, right? So Amanda had had this background at University of Victoria and had done some bioarchaeology and had worked outside of anthropology for a while and was coming back um, and could sort of articulate that. And by the last section where, where it's why, why McMaster, you can say, look, I've told you all this stuff about what I'm interested in and here's why, you know, this is, this particular set of questions drive me. And what do you know, you know, Dr. Brickley and her laboratory is, is the perfect place for me to pursue that. And the reason why I would structure it that way is you were making your life easier in terms of, you know, why McMaster. <clears throat> and then when the various sub-disciplines sit to talk about these applications, you know, and this goes back to Patrick's earlier question. I mean, it may well be that the potential advisor didn't have a chance to reach out and chat with Patrick, but then suddenly it's like, well, wait a second, this is fantastic. I need to reach out to Patrick and talk about how these alignments work. So it's almost like you're trying to imagine what this potential relationship, because it is in terms of working with an advisor, it's a professional relationship, um, what that might look like. And so this, this proposal is laying, like literally laying the runway for what that, what that will look like. Thank you so much. Um, Lauren, I see you've got your hand up to chime in. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, um, I think there's so many things that are kind of like hidden in the grad application process. Um, and I was a first generation student, so first to graduate from university, certainly the first to go to grad school. And so I really leaned a lot on those faculty members that I had good relationships with and maybe they said oh are you going to grad school and then I went to them and said can you support me with my application or even talking to a TA if I didn't feel comfortable going to a professor but the other thing is also taking advantage if, if you're currently in an institution um, of career services there um, because they can help you sort of frame some of these questions of like why do this um, and depending on the services that are available like I actually utilize those services to help me with my research proposal to go through it and these sorts of things. So that's something that might also exist at your institution if you're in undergrad or in your master's. That's a great point. Um, I know when I wrote mine, I also um, went to the people who I actually asked to be my referees. Um, so they not only knew me a little bit better, that's why I was comfortable asking them to write those references for me, um, but they were, as a result, a little bit more familiar with kind of what my research interests and goals were. So they were able to actually give really kind of formative feedback on that proposal. So obviously some of, the, some of that privileges people who are currently in uh, <laughs> post-secondary, um, but you know, if you are reaching out to people that previously were your instructors um, or even someone maybe you know who works in anthropology, whether that's in the academy or in industry, and you can say to them, hey, do you mind kind of taking a look at this? As Lauren said, you know, writing services can be really helpful. Career services can be really helpful. Um, so definitely, you know, look to take advantage of whatever resources you have available. Um, it is, I'm sure, frustrating to know we can't just give you a sample and a template for you to follow. Um, but it really, the, the whole point of this is it should be as unique to you as your research interests are. Um, you really are, this is your chance to kind of sell yourself um, to, the, to the program, but also kind of as, as you know, Dr. Roddick mentioned the whole kind of why Mac, that's also this kind of, how do we go together? Where do you see that relationship with the department taking you? Um, and kind of how can we benefit each other through this process? Um, so I hope that helped answer that question. There's another uh, question here from Patrick, really great one. Um, with respect to an interest in medical anthropology uh, and research focus on autism. I can actually say, Patrick, I have a peer in my cohort whose uh, doctoral research is on autism as well. So um, it exists in the department, um, but given the medical anthropology question um, or element to this, maybe um, Dr. Burek, if you don't mind speaking to that. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think, uh, yeah, the student that Martha's mentioning is working with Dr. Ellen Badone, who has some expertise in this area. Um, Ellen is uh, sort of uh, on, on her way to retirement, unfortunately, but, um, you know, uh, this is kind of outside my main area. Um, you know, if you have a, a specific proposal, um, you know, you can send it my way. I will say I have quite a lot of students right now and I have some students also interested that I've spoken with. So I'm not sure about the volume of students I'll accept. Um, but uh, but yeah, if you want to reach out um, and, you know, send me a more a thorough proposal or ideas, um, you know, I'm happy to look at it. And, and um, I would say the people in the department who would have potential would be um, Ellen Bedone, uh, myself, um, and that that might be it. <laughs> um, you know, in in my opinion, yeah. Yeah. To be clear, Ellen Bedone actually has retired, so she won't be accepting any any new students. All right. Um, so I want to. There's a couple other questions here that we've kind of had submitted in advance. Um, so I want to kind of open things up here, and and this speaks a bit more to maybe kind of the uh, Mac experience, for lack of a better phrase. Um, so want to open the floor up, generally speaking, but maybe we'll start with some student perspectives um, and then flip over to to faculty perspectives on this. But just wanting to open up the floor to our student panelists, kind of what's your experience of being at Mac, being in Hamilton. Um, how do you find the kind of social life of the department, um, that collegial element? I know we always have lots going on. I'm on, I think, almost all the committees this year. <laughs> um, but so I see a lot of that, right, where um, we're posting things about having a bonfire and everyone gets together and it's a chance to hang out. Um, or we do, we all get together and we go bowling. Um, so there's lots of different kind of social things like that happening. But I really want to open it up to, to our student panelists to share a bit about what they're experiences being an active student in the program. Um, so if you want to raise a hand, if you want to chime in, otherwise I'll put someone on the spot. <laughs> Amanda, I see that smile. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so I would say that I came from a similarly small department at the University of Victoria. Um, and I, I really like the McMaster department for that reason, um, because it, it, I feel like it fosters that collegialism, I guess maybe is the right word. Um, and, uh, so it's just a really warm and welcoming environment. Uh, and it was right off the bat. And, um, I think my cohort, we were eight people and, um, we've all, we have a group chat and we're good friends. And, uh, but at the same time, like, um, the students who had already been in the program um, were also very welcoming. And so some of those larger social events, um, they really bridge that gap to um, ensure that you develop relationships with people further along in the program. And then you turn around and do the same for those who are incoming as well. So my little eight person cohort feels like it's grown exponentially uh, now that I'm in my second year um, in both directions, which I really appreciate. And the social events that I've been able to attend, like the bonfire, for example, um, two years running now, um, it's been really great to sit and chat with everybody in a different environment, things like that. So um, yeah, and there's like the lounge um, where you can always sort of find somebody or chocolate once a week, which is very welcome. Um, uh, so yeah, it's just, I really appreciate that in the department. It's been, it's been really great for me. Ren, how about you? Sorry to put you on the spot. I want to hear though about what your experience has been like, especially with the lab nice. work. <laughs> <laughs> um, coming from U of T, I did my undergrad from U of T and I came straight to Mac after. Um, it was, I made the transition during COVID, which was in itself a big a, a big challenge, but I think Mac in general is, has been very welcoming. Coming Again, coming from U of T was a relatively bigger school. It was harder to make friends, especially during the time of COVID, um, but I'm part of Amanda's cohort, and as she said, um, we are very tight with each other, and 
it, and it's it has grown over um, the year that we've been together. And um, as part of the lab, again, as I mentioned, because we have so many students in biology and biochemistry, um, I've also been able to branch out into events that are happening in other departments. And MAC in general is just so welcoming in terms of uh, the different departments and events that they have. So it's been really easy to do that branching out. Thank you so much. And I think that's a, you know, a really great point about Mac as a welcoming community that McMaster University is a medium-sized university, but that what we mean by medium-sized is, you know, we're talking about sort of student population and departments available and things like that. Um, but the campus itself is actually fairly concentrated. There are some satellite um, sort of buildings and, and parts to the campus, you know, downtown we have some, there's connections to Hamilton Health Sciences, um, but the main campus itself is actually very much um, a kind of compact <laughs> campus. There's still lots of green space, which is lovely, lots of um, beautiful architecture and things like that, but it really gives it that lovely sense of community because everyone is really right there. It's right next door. We have um, in our department for the students shared offices. So you come into campus to maybe do some work. You're more than likely going to run into someone, whether they're from your cohort or as Amanda said, you know, a year ahead, a year behind. Um, so it's really, really wonderful to be able to kind of develop that collegial um, relationship with your peers, with faculty even. Um, I know there's been plenty of times where I've been on campus. Um, I actually, I have my daughter, I brought her with me um, and I popped in and, you know, hi everyone. And you just stick your head in the door. I've had chats with Andy and John that way with um, Cal, with other students. So um, it really is a very welcoming environment. There's lots of effort to have those um, social interactions and time together both within the department and throughout the city of Hamilton. Um, I know one of the fan favorites is Fairweather, which is a local brewery, which is really close to campus. I can see everyone nodding. Yep, we've all been there for, for a pint and some commiseration as we all go through the challenges of grad school. Um, but it really is just such a welcoming environment. Um, so, you know, I can't sing the praises enough of not only just the city of Hamilton itself, but also um, this particular department in really being attentive to, to their students in that respect and, and wanting it to be a welcoming place uh, where you're encouraged to learn and grow and develop these interdisciplinary relationships because that enriches not only your own work, um, but the work of everyone else within the, within the department. I do see an, a question. Yes, the uh, recording will be made available after. Um, we'll be sending that out to the email address that you registered for the session for. Um, so that will go out. I won't say it's going to be instant because it's going to be a big file, but we will make sure that that gets out uh, before the end of the week. So people have this as a resource to come back to. We also plan on putting this recording up on um, the Faculty of Social Sciences YouTube page. Um, so we'll link to that as well. Well, um, so another great way to kind of follow up, go back, hear what we have to say again, um, and sort of share uh, this with anybody else who might be interested in grad studies at McMaster in anthropology. We have about 10 minutes left, though. Um, and so I just want to kind of give one last opportunity, um, if anyone has questions, to quickly pop them in that Q&A. Otherwise, um, maybe just to quickly run through the panel, if there's any sort of last comments that people want to make, um, I'll jump maybe to our students first, and then our faculty, and we'll end off with John. So, um, Acacia, maybe if there's any final comments you want to say about your experience, or maybe a favorite course, whatever you want to kind of add, um, to just give a quick wrap up. To be honest, I think everybody has put it so well talking about the department and living in Hamilton. So I I don't have much to add to that. Thank you. Lauren, do you want to hop in? Yeah, just in terms of like the, the Mac experience, I think John and I were talking about there's sort of like a Mac bubble. Um, as he mentioned, it's sort of like Westdale, Dundas, sort of like the campus is located in an affluent area. And um, there, I grew up in Hamilton and often there's these things about Hamilton where people are like, oh, I can't go downtown. It's kind of sketchy. I will tell you it's not. <laughs> um, and there's a lot happening. So if you can break out of that Mac bubble, obviously there's lots right around campus, um, but downtown has a lot going on in terms of like arts, shops, 
amazing little food places uh, kind of hidden and tucked away. So it's a really active, vibrant city. Awesome. We'll pop back to location, then we'll jump to Amanda. Yeah, I guess just to add to that, I live downtown. It's very nice. I'm very close to a lot of things. And because there is such a strong throw through between students and downtown and Westdale, it's very easy to commute from downtown to get Westdale. There's like, I don't know, like five different bus lines up. We'll get you there. And yeah, it's I downtown sometimes has a bad reputation, but I live like right here by the GO station and I very much enjoy it. Amanda, did you want to chime in as well? Yeah, I mean, I was basically going to say the same thing. Um, Akisha and I live really close by and I can actually see Ren from the rooftop patio. So we're all really close and right downtown. Um, and uh, I mean, I came from Surrey, which has an even like a real reputation um, in Canada and like comparatively and everything. I just wanted to say like downtown Hamilton, where we live, it's wonderful. Um, don't let People say the negative things about Hamilton that you might hear. Don't be swayed by that. It's a wonderful city and there's so much going on all the time, which I really appreciate. Often on weekends, I will just Google what's happening in Hamilton and there's so much all the time um, to take part in and really get out there and explore. Um, and of course, there is also the more natural environment as well, which John has already mentioned. So um, yes, campus is a little bubble, but like there's so much to explore. And for myself and my husband, we've just really enjoyed moving to a different province and being able to really explore um, the whole area. Although I still feel like we've only seen a small corner of Ontario, um, work in progress. That's fantastic. And I, I really appreciate you mentioning that. Um, I, once we had my daughter, we moved to have a little bit more room for her, but I was right downtown as well. I was right off of, uh, Jane street North and, um, it's that sort of like the main thoroughfare, um, kind of downtown and, um, every month, is it the last Friday? I think there's art crawl. Um, and then there's every, few months there's like super crawl and literally they like close the whole street down there's art vendors all over the place um and it basically becomes sort of almost like this giant block party <laughs> um, which is really really cool and such like an amazing experience to be a part of um so there's always stuff going on as folks have said um I want to give Ren a chance to chime in if you'd like about your experience and then we'll hop over to um Dr. Burke and Dr. Roddick I think everyone's already done a great job highlighting the positive uh, experiences of um, Hamilton, but I do want to add one more piece of advice for applications. I really want to highlight the importance of speaking with previous and current students. I know for me, it really helped with my application, my proposal, writing, speaking with uh, previous and current students in our current lab, just to see what our supervisor is looking for, what the department is looking for, and how my interests um, best fit into uh, the current dynamics of the lab in the department. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind when making your application. I don't know if Cal or Andy wants to jump in next. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, I think everyone's covered things pretty well. Um, I guess, you know, I'll just say one thing I've appreciated. I came to McMaster in 2020, so I'm not, I haven't been here that long, but, um, one thing I appreciate, I think, is is sort of the, I guess, small or medium size of the department. Um, and it's been really neat uh, in my own capacity as an instructor, but also um, as a committee member to um, like really meaningfully kind of get to know or engage um, students and, and colleagues in other subfields and, and kind of learn about the way they see the world and the questions they're asking. And I'll shout out here to to Ren, who was an awesome participant in a cultural anthro grad seminar. And I feel like I learned so much from Ren. Um, and, you know, we learned from each other in this really cool way. Uh, and um, even though we're in very different fields of inquiry and, um, and yeah, and Amanda as well. I'm, I'm on Amanda's committee, who's a bioarchaeologist, and I've already like learned so much from her evolving research. So that's something like I kind of have appreciated. Ren, do you want to chime in before we hop over to Andy? Just very quickly, in terms of favorite courses, Dr. Birk's Bodies, Politics, and Data course is one of my favorites. So the feeling is very mutual. I I second that. I loved that course. 
uh, Amanda, sorry, Andy, we will get to you. I just want to wrap up the student portion. Okay, well, if we're going with favorite courses, then I'm going to do a plug for Dr. Radek's writing in the field, because honestly, that was the best course I have taken in graduate school, period. It was the most useful. I cannot recommend it enough. I think it should actually just be a required course. And with that glowing recommendation, Andy, any final I words? The manager's lead work for me is what she did. Um, yeah, no, I think, yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully this AMA has given folks a sense of... Um, yeah, the collegiality, right? I mean, I think like any department, there's always frictions and there's always frustrations, which again, which is why, uh, as uh, as Ren also just said, you know, reaching out to students and getting getting those kind of that kind of feedback is important. But um, um, I mean, I think the final other sort of thing I would say is that um, you know Hamilton's located in a pretty ideal spot, both you know in terms of the city and the the kind of green space that we have, but also in terms of the research research networks. Um, so, for instance, for my work, uh, I have a lot of colleagues at at Toronto and Chicago, um, and we really are kind of in a nice a nice spot to build research networks. And I think a lot of the faculty and graduate students um, can can build those out uh, in very productive ways. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind as you're looking at universities is is getting a sense for how those networks can can evolve and 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 uh, and develop. Um, and then I guess the final other thing we haven't said explicitly is is the great staff, right? So um, John, uh, before we pass it to John, you know, John is is the front facing person on a lot of these applications, and so um, you know, if if uh, if he doesn't have the answer to the question, we'll we'll find it. Um, we have a a wonderful set of instructional assistants in the various labs. We you know Delia Hutchinson at the front office and Katie Miller, who's in charge of undergrad. So um, we have a very you know, again, small to medium sized department, but sort of fairly, fairly tight knit. Um, and before I hand it to John too, another final plug. Um, so 50th anniversary, uh, 1974, our department was was founded. There was some anthropology happening before that point, but um, in sort of the landscape of, of Canadian anthropology, um, that's fairly, doesn't may not seem early, but it's, uh, it's a fairly early um, sort of department. And so keep an eye on those same spaces where Martha, Martha is going to be sharing some of this information on social media sites, um, there'll be a variety of other things sort of highlighting some of the history of this department, um, which will also be a, you know, uh, perhaps a, a view into, into McMaster anthropology. What can I say that hasn't been said already? Um, well, basically everything that's been highlighted, I actually have template emails and packages with links to dining and tourism Hamilton and all that. So please Please, again, reach out to me for that, but also for the academic side of things as well. Um, as I said, I'm I'm your go-to person if you just want any basic information. So don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, it looks like our Q&A uh, list is empty. It's 129. So with this last 60 seconds, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists for participating and being here for sharing your experiences and your insight um, and to all of our attendees for asking such wonderful questions for really engaging meaningfully here. Um, definitely reach out to folks. Um, we students are available to give you that perspective. Um, our faculty and John are around to give you that other side, that um, potential supervisor conversation or how do I Put this application together. Um, as John said, those great links to kind of give you a bit more insight into what Hamilton is like as a city to live in. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, and hopefully we'll be seeing some applications from you folks soon. Have a great day, everyone.